I want to get into a little different subject here for just a moment, although I want to get back to this in in a moment as well. Um, But talk about what you observe is the most damaging lie of all, that that loveless sex is actually empowering. (laughs) Yeah, I know. You'd have think people would have figured this out by now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, I think it started with my generation in the 90s, um, like the show Sex in the City, that was, you know, a, a huge hit show on HBO. Everyone loved it. Everyone identified with it. You know, I would watch it with my friends, my mother. We all loved it because it was funny. Um, we didn't really think too hard about the message of that show. To us, it was just like a fun romp and these girls, single ladies in New York City. But looking back, and I've had other friends my age also tell me that how, tr- how like that show basically like ruined their lives mm-hmm. because... <laughs> In real life, real life is not a TV show. Real life, you don't have cute outfits and you don't have a cute apartment and constant string of like cute boys to date. In real life, you're lonely a lot. You're, uh, you know, maybe desperate to get married, maybe really want a family, don't know how to get one. And it's just this endless string of like meaningless dating. You know, I say dating as a euphemism. It's a, it's a family friendly show. Um, it doesn't make you... <laughs> It, it does, of course, doesn't make you happy, but we, we were sold the lie that part of feminism means that a woman can be just like a man and have sex like a man without falling in love every time that you can just, you know, like a man could have a string of kind of one night stands and not, you know, his heart. It's not about his love for him. Um, women are men are built different. OK, for women, we were told we could do that too, that you can just have, you know, a million one night stands and you know, it's fine. You're just like a man. But we, no one told us that, that really Sex and City is about gay men. It's a show written by gay men. And this is a gay male lifestyle. Okay. Like constant, you know, string of endless one night stands. Um, that is a common gay lifestyle. It's not a lifestyle that's ever been normal for straight women. It's never been normalized in our culture for straight, successful, together, career girls or women to have just meaningless sexual encounters with no after effects of any kind. And the show sold us that lie. The characters ended up miserable and alone. Um, Carrie Bradshaw ended up, you know, divorced and miserable. Um, it, It was not a happy ending for any of them. And now, you know, Uh, the influences are even more nefarious. And so I I don't understand, like, don't you understand that you're not a man? You're not a man. You're not a gay man. You're a woman. And women who deny that they form emotional attachments, that's just a denial of biology. We know that's not true. You, if you like someone enough to go on a date with him, if you like someone enough to sleep with him, I guarantee you, in your little heart, deep down, you kind of wish he liked you enough to like want want you as his girlfriend, and you've been you can deny that all you want, but that's just a fact. You know that fact is is being shrouded over in some sense because of technology. Uh, I think about Tammy Wynette singing "Now I Have the Pill." The pill has been an ecological disaster. Uh, which, right. which, which, which seems counterintuitive with uh, the people that are most promoting the pill. Uh, uh, talk about how, I mean, you've pretty much said it already, but th- th- this is a lie. Th- th- this is like, okay, I have the pill. Now I can be promiscuous as men are being promiscuous. And there's no difference, no distinction. I'll be happy. It's a complete ruse. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really great that you said it's ecological disaster, but because, yeah, we're just only now, you know, learning about the damage to our water table, like all that estrogen pumped into, uh, you know, city water systems and little boys drinking the water, bathing in the water. Is it the cause of our fertility crisis? All the xenoestrogens floating around. Is this why... Is this why boys are more likely to become trans? They they have lower testosterone because they're they've been like literally swimming and bathing in estrogen since they were babies. I mean, I don't know, maybe from the womb. Um, yeah, the pill the pill is such an interesting thing because it is like um, it's like Chekhov's gun. You know, if you give a girl the pill as like, well, just in case, you know, just in case, honey, like when your daughter gets her period, that's often when mothers will give them the pill. 
the girl has the pill. So it's not, it's no longer a just in case it's, oh, well now I can actually do whatever I want. It's not just like an emergency backup situation. It's I'm on the pill now. So nothing matters. So let's go. Um, we're also learning more and more now about the after effects of the pill. They actually cause women. I like to joke the real reason, the real way the pill works is not that it sterilizes you, but it makes you basically lose all interest <laughs> in sex. It decreases women's libido dramatically. Um, it causes weight gain. It causes crazy hormonal fluctuations that can all make you really uninterested in dating. Um, and then I saw a statistic, I think it was last year, they did a study that said there's much higher rates of lesbianism from formerly straight women who had been on the pill. They actually lost all interest in men just generally, <laughs> thanks to the artificial hormones. Isn't that interesting? Because is that one of the causes why so many women are just choosing to, they're lesbians now, you know? Um, and so, yeah, the birth control pill, the other thing about it is that a lot of women I know who, um, you know, they want another child, they're on birth control, or maybe they're on um, long-term birth control, like an IUD, you know, which is sort of implanted in you. And you have to actually make it a doctor's appointment and have it removed before you get pregnant again. And for the pill, you have to go off it and be off it for a while before you can get pregnant again. So it, it does seem like the biggest choice that women may have to make once you're on a form of birth control is, well, when do you get off it? And that can be very scary because you have to actually make an active decision to stop doing this thing that you've been doing for a long time. You have to actually make it call, call the doctor, have them do something to you. And then it's kind of scary because your safety net is gone. And that it can be very easy for someone to say, well, I'll do that later. You know, not today, next week, next week. And lo and behold, a year goes by and another year ticks by and you're still on it because you just can't make that active decision to stop. It's just a little bit of a barrier to your decision making process. And it really does get in the way because you have to time it and then you look at your calendar oh, do I want to get pregnant around Christmas? Should we wait till the summer? As if you can time a pregnancy. You cannot time your pregnancy unless you're very lucky. <laughs> you know, the average time it takes someone to get pregnant is a year. And that's for fertile young people. It can take a year. You know, unless you're very blessed, it can take you longer. You never know what, what can happen. You might get pregnant right away and then you have a tragic miscarriage and you have to start the process over. So you I try to tell experience. people- I did have that experience. My first pregnancy, you know, we were like, you know, babes in the woods. We had no, I didn't even know any, what was going on. I thought once you were pregnant, that was it. I never even really knew about miscarriage. I thought it was something like, you know, very, very rare. I didn't know that it basically happens to almost everyone I know. And uh, we had seen the baby's heartbeat. It was three months. We had you know, basically named the baby at that point. We were, you know, fine. Everything's fine. And so to see on the screen, you see the fetus, the little, you know, the little peanut, and then suddenly you're not hearing the heartbeat. And you're like, where's the heartbeat? It was just this really shocking moment, mm. really horrible moment in my life. My husband and I were just like, what, what? And uh, you know, that triggered all these things, but it triggered my husband to convert to Catholicism. <laughs> he informed me that week that he was going to become a cat, go back. He'd been baptized as a baby, but he was going back because he couldn't, he couldn't even handle like the grief that we were experiencing. Um. So, so yeah, I mean, things, you know, luckily I'm very fortunate. I got pregnant, I think four months later and, and that baby is about to turn 18 years old, mm. <laughs> which is like incredible. Um, so there is obviously hope after, after miscarriage, but it can, it can delay you. There's all kinds of things that can happen and the pill and the long-term birth control, it just like delays it so much. And then it requires this very heavy mental lift to, to, to figure out, well, Am I really going to do this? How am I going to afford that baby? Sometimes it is better to just let nature take its course. It just seems like let nature make that decision for you. I had two children. Uh, like sometimes we would, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of natural family planning, which is a non-hormonal way of kind of timing things out, which I recommend to some people. To You have to, you can avoid, you know, um, if you don't want to have like Irish twins, you know, um, that, which is fine, but, <laughs> um, but I think twice in my life, we were just like completely stunned 
and found ourselves pre- found me pregnant again. Um, you know, probably before I was ready or wasn't expecting it. And those turned out to be just such incredible blessings. The surprises mm. became like, well, you know, thank goodness. Like I remember for my second, my doctor, after my first, I wasn't Catholic yet. My doctor had given me a prescription for birth control pills, like on the first postpartum visit, you know, he just, they, they, they all doctors just throw that to you. They just give it to you. They give you the lecture. You can't have another baby, you know, don't get pregnant again wait three years, whatever. And so I had it in my purse. I was like, I don't know. I'll think about it later. And I wasn't even conscious of really making any decisions at that point. I wasn't, I didn't want to go on the pill, but I wasn't necessarily like, you know, like I said, I wasn't Catholic yet. So I wasn't like um, necessarily, I wasn't really sure, but I hadn't made that decision. And so I found out I was pregnant again when I had a six month old baby at home and I was pregnant again. (laughs) And, um, yeah, no idea how that happened to this day. And I sometimes I just think to myself, um, like I think I was joking to my husband, did I did I sit in something? Like I don't know how that happened. Um, <laughs> but like my gosh, what if I had what if I had decided, oh yeah, I better he told me to take them. I better pop those pills, you know, then there's I, I have this child now who's alive, who's a teenager. And so you you kind of, you know, it's like the magic of not choosing sometimes is the best choice. Hmm. You mentioned just briefly in passing the IUD, and you do deal with this in your book, but I don't think people are sufficiently aware of the horror of that device. (laughs) Yeah. um, Like I said, doctors, uh, I have yet to meet a doctor who's ever (laughs) felt the way I do about these things. They're all on board with all of it. And so I had my, um, I had my last baby um with the last one yeah and you know my fifth baby and i was i mean my i was in my 40s and so she read my doctor recommended told me i was catholic at this time and she said we should get on the iud get i can put one in for you and i was like uh you know don't think so but i never really heard of it and i was like what even is that i was i had no intention of doing it i didn't do it obviously um but I researched it at that point to find out what, what is this? And my friends, my liberal friends were telling me about their experience and how unbelievably painful it was to have it in, have it put in you. It's like a permanent device that lives in your uterus or something. Um, one of my mother's best friends um, for many, many decades was rendered permanently infertile by the very first IUD, the Dalcon shield, which ended up killing, I think hundreds of women and rendered infertile you know, several million women, I believe. And the, the Dalcon Shield, there was giant lawsuits and it was a uh, credible malpractice. Um, and so I grew up knowing that this woman, you know, she adopted two children because of her IUD experience. So I've always been wary of it. And then in the course of researching the book, I found out about um, one of the forms is a, is not just one that just physically prevents egg, uh, whatever implantation, it releases hormones. So it's like having a a long-term hormone releasing device at all times in your body. And, and just reading, reading women's reports of the after of the side effects was, was, was scary. And I, yeah, I include those just direct quotes from some message board I found, which is like, honestly, there was hundreds of messages of women saying, I gained 50 pounds. I'm suicidal. The doctors think I'm crazy. They want to. They won't take it out. They want to put me on antidepressants, but I know it's not that. It's cause of the, the hormonal IUD, and like no one will help me. And the nurses will whisper. This is pre-COVID, you know. The nurses will whisper, "You're not alone." Like lots of girls, it's the IUD, but we're not allowed to say that. Hmm. They're not allowed to say anything bad about these miracles. These miracles that are liberating women from their own fertility. Um, you're not allowed to talk about what the birth control pill long-term does to women. It causes, oh, it causes breast cancer. You know, wow. Have you noticed there's a spike in breast cancer in the last, you know, 40 years? Huh. Oh, birth control pill causes breast cancer. How interesting. <laughs> you're not allowed to talk about these side effects to these, you know, things that are given out like candy to whoever, to little kids, to, to young girls. Um, but there are side effects. There's, and I think it's important to really take charge 
of your body as a woman. That's part of the, the supernatural power of being a woman. You need to, you need, it's very powerful. You need to take care of it because there's a lot of people, they wear white coats and they have doctor's badges and nurses badges and they're, they're women's activists, they're women's health exer- experts, but they are often, you know, um, have other agendas and they may not be trying to hurt you physically, but they really, really, really don't want you having too many kids. And that's just the bottom line <laughs> in my experience. Yeah. I want to go to the other side of the equation. I mean, it's not necessarily the other side of the equation, but uh, you, you talk about men and how they are being enslaved by smut. It, 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 it's not just men, again, but a predominant number of men in our culture are literally enslaved to pornography today. And it starts at a very early age, right. and what you have in your hand with the, uh, with the smartphone is oftentimes the gateway. Yeah, uh, absolutely. My son was first exposed to pornography on another po- little boy's cell-, cell phone at a, of all places, a Catholic uh, carnival, like a fair. They were in line for a ride. <laughs> they must have been, I don't know, eight years old, seven or eight years old. And another boy who did not go to that school had his phone and showed them a picture of a close up of a. <laughs> penetrative <laughs> act and it was horrifying to these two little boys this is at a catholic school it was horrifying to them and then it required us to mm. have to talk about what it was and they didn't know it they didn't know the birds and the bees at that point so we had to kind of have a whole emergency you know, session like oh my gosh so it's very hard to escape um it's so pervasive and it is so addictive you know there's been some of the things i cite in the book um Pascal Gobri did a great piece about proving scientifically that pornography addiction is basically the same as meth addiction. It's the same pathways in the brain. It's the same after effects in your brain, the same withdrawal, the same habituation. You need to kind of keep ratcheting it up, getting a bigger dose of more extreme imagery or whatever. And um, and it's very hard to quit. And it is like taking a drug and it you become kind of you know, unable to form healthy, normal relationships with human beings. <laughs> and it is so destructive. And not to mention it is a grave sin. You know, we, we, you and I are aware of, you know, just the, the destructive lifestyles behind the camera of the exploited men and women on the camera, like just it's human trafficking and drug use and all the rest of it. I think a lot of these porn sites have have children children are being victimized with no recourse of any kind so when you watch it you're taking part in that world and you're contributing to it and you're giving them money and attention and it just it's bad in every way um yeah so so young men because the dating world but here's the thing because women have become feminism thanks to feminism women don't need men anymore they're not interested in you as a provider they're not interested in you. They're all bisexual, lesbians, or non-binary, so they don't need you for anything. Um, men also have a crisis of loneliness, a crisis of identity. And, I mean, I understand why men are drawn to to pornography websites or to places like OnlyFans, where you can kind of have a kind of like a fake digital girlfriend who will know your name and she'll talk to you and you just keep sending money she'll be your friend you know the girlfriend experience um it's very depressing it's really sad and i mean what can i say as a parent you know you just have to kind of at a very early age be like this like you will go to hell <laughs> like yeah you look at that stuff you're going to hell like it's really really bad the devil that's the devil trying to tempt you so we're trying to do that with our kids again there's no guarantee in life i mean i think that sometimes they can you know, they can, you can stumble across something, you can, someone can send you a meme with something and you have to like, you're, so they're aware of it, you know, and they've been taught about it in school. They educate them on the dangers of pornography. Um, and so I think they are scared of it the way they are with drugs. I mean, we really, in our house, we treat it the same as a drug. You know, it's, it's like, you, you're not gonna smoke meth, right? So don't look at this. It's just meth for your eyes. <laughs>